going everybody it's your man Corey overtime Anderson out here in Jersey City we about to do the morning combat show I'm trying to sit up taller too to look less fat so maybe this will all play together morning combat you know just one of those top fight media shows you don't sugarcoat it they just bring it to you the real news I'm your type you're tight yeah where's the why did you call him Luke why is there any What's his name? Big Blue. Big Blue. I, whatever the fuck. Hey, your name is Applesauce if I wanted to be. You understand? <laughs> okay. Looks in a good mood today. All right, OT, you're going to slide in right here. It's tight. It's tight for three men. You know, right. Don't make it easy here. If you've wrestled your whole life against guys awkward. much grosser than I. It's going to get weak. Oh, I Every time, bro. <laughs> Not like you. Every time, bro. <laughs> well, because he carries himself with an air that he's like higher than us socially. I, don't. And, I really don't. And, It's champions only around here. And our next guest here on Room Service Diaries on November 18th, he might just claim that championship belt he's been looking for for a very long time. It is overtime, Corey Anderson. Hi, Corey, how are you? What's going on, Luke? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing well. By the way, as we're talking about Bellator 288, November 18th on Showtime, you versus Nemkov. Although, Vadim Nemkov, although prior to the beginning of the show, we were talking about mowing our lawns. Well, we were talking He's got about, the joint that you see the city guys have where yeah. you can pull the handles in two directions. Now, you're, you're, you look country strong, but has your country life and your acreage ever had a couch like this that you called home and relaxed on? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it's like something we found off that 70 show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is, you know, it, this is where they find dead hookers on couches like this. I'm oh, yeah. sorry to say that. The only part. thing we're missing is the plastic, man. Make it remind of my old great grandma. Yes, it is that awful. They probably <laughs> peeled it off and brought it here. How are you doing these days, Corey? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing fantastic, actually, you know. Since Why fantastic? Fight. Since the fight, you know, me and my family up and left Jersey finally. I'm still here training. I come back to New Jersey and train for camp. But we living back in the Midwest, uh, bought a new house, I've been buying properties, I got land, I got two beautiful kids, I got a wonderful wife, I mean, I have no complaints in life. I got my hunting show, I'm just, man, I'm just enjoying life. I wake up every day and live the dream. You know what John Mellencamp would say to that? Ain't that America for you and me. Okay, I mean, the exit's that way. <laughs> uh, the exit when when people Shh. use the term uh, Midwestern values, is that still a thing? Do you still represent that? Yes, 100%. Midwestern, blue collar, it's all the same to me, but uh, I'm a country boy, you know? I grew up with horses, cows, dogs. I had chores to do before I would go to school, and I come home and do chores before I go back to practice and get off practice, come back and work for my dad's roofing company and do chores until time to go to bed and homework. So for me, hard work is nothing. That's blue collar, and that's... Midwest, that's all I know, you know. Uh, personalities, Midwest personalities are so much different than the East Coast. I've been here for, was in New Jersey for eight years, since 2014, mm -hmm. and finally go back to the Midwest, and I'm finally actually spending time in communities, and I'm coaching at a college now, and uh, just, you, I go knock on doors, ask for permission for hunting, and like here I would get turned down, people are like, get off my property, this, this, and this. And I go to Indiana and knock on the door and ask for permission. They're like, oh, we already gave somebody else. But welcome to Indiana. How are you doing? How's your family? Oh my God, how was your kids? And we sit there and have a conversation for an hour. It's just, and that's the life I love, you know? Yeah, they, don't do they don't bitch, do that in D.C., They don't Anyone do that. out here. $80 haircuts yeah, on that motherfucker. Yeah, but they're also not as secretly racist either. There's that difference as well. <laughs> anyway. Um... Hold on, let me ask you. You mentioned your dad was in a roofing, had a roofing company. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fighting is is a very tough job. Let's throw that out for just the record. Toughest job you ever had was what? Roofing. Roofing. My, I was what is, to my tell brother. folks what, like, what, what, because I always feel like roofing entails two big problems. One, your balance better be on point, right? Number one. <laughs> I would go to hot as shit as number one. And that's yeah. the other one too. Dude, I mean, you can't, it's like, even if you're a day laborer, you might be able to get under the trees. Bro, you're, I mean, you're getting cooked on that roof. I mean, me and my brother, I was talking to my brother last night about this and, uh, like, it wasn't, not just roofing is hard, but roofing for my father. Anybody knows my father, he's just a hard worker, which is where I got my mentality from. And then I've worked with other guys on the roof, like, help somebody else at, else at their house or with another company. It was, like, cake work. Like, this is this is easy. Mm. That's for my father. It was always miserable. <laughs> it was not just because it was my father, just the way he works, and that's the way I train. So I would say, like, the hot aspect, it was it's crazy, and the balance, and then, like, growing up, I didn't get to do wrestling camps and football camps like most people because I had to work. So my dad would turn every job site into, like, a training camp for me. <laughs> like he would make me do certain things in my wrestling stands. Like, stay in your stands and pull the roof up. We turn her, you stay this in your stands. This is like Mr. Miyagi <laughs> shit. But that's my father. Like, everything he does, he make it into a workout. Like, you think you missing workouts and practice? No, you getting a different workout. And then when I got in college, I got to the point where I was trying to cut weight. In the summertime, I wear a hoodie on the roof. Like, it started Damn. off cold, and, like, midday, like, 1 o'clock when it's the hottest, my sweatshirt is soaking. I'm like, yo, take your hoodie off. Like, I'm good. 
what do you mean? It was just mental. Like, if I can work through this all day, eight, nine hours a day and just sweat, like, I'm about to die. When I get back to college, practice ain't going to be nothing. When the coach turns the heat up, I'm so it's okay. I'm at home right now. So that's just the mentality. D different, different kind of animal. We say that in general about fighters because you guys are different and we look up to a lot of those almost courageous aspects. But how about the hard work, the dedication? Do you feel like throughout your history, whether it's been collegiate wrestling, whether it's been mixed martial arts, that more often than not, you've just outworked people? Like, you got skill, you got technique, you've knocked some MFers out. But for a while, it must have been like, you could see people breaking and you'd be like, the, the roofing, the Midwest, like all that, it prepared me for this. Oh, 100%. I've dedicated all to that, you know, ever since, like I said, high school, college. I wasn't a good wrestler until I got to college. You know, I've always worked hard. I've always had no problems. Well, not always. At one point, I was a 300-pound, fat, lazy kid, so I was lazy then. But then once I started losing weight and realized what hard work actually got me, like getting into college and met this coach who I actually work with now at Marion University, he actually told me, like, yo, you got the work ethic, just keep pushing. And uh, so now it's like I know in every match, no matter who it is, before I had the technique, before I was knocking people out, before I knew how to throw a jab, cross, throw a kick, it was like Mark Henry would say, you outwork everybody. Just go outwork them. That's all Mark here. Just go outwork them. My coach, outwork everybody. Dominate. Don't just win. Outwork them and dominate. So now that I have that and I have the skills, I have the wrestling, I have the striking, the kicks, now it's go out there and do what we prepare to do. And if it gets ugly, just outwork them. Well, how do you go from, as you put it, a 300-pound overweight kid, because that's, that's a pretty bad place to be, to dialed-in athlete? What, what has to happen in your life for that to be made possible? I, to be honest, it all happened. Uh, since I moved to Indiana, the guy I started with, my backup heavyweight at the time, we both were fat and we had titties. and uh, <laughs> We like to call star. those, respectfully, we call, we call them moves. Moves, moves my bad, yep. moves. Okay. And uh, we was like, I'm going to have abs one day. But like, yeah, right, you're not going to have abs. And, like, I bet you'll have abs before you. And that's actually how I started losing weight. At a heavyweight, I didn't care how I looked. But then uh, we was always in competition to get abs. And then we would do ab work, and I started losing weight. And it started feeling good to lose weight. Wrestling just seemed a little easier. I could move a lot better. And uh, over time, like, I, now he's like a body, but he's like 375 pounds, but he's strong as a Barox. But I'm 235 pounds, but I'm cut, you know what I mean? But we both have our attributes, and we were talking about this last week before I left, and we was lifting. Like, you you look like that because of our competition. Like, why really you look that way? <laughs> it's because the competition we used to have in college. And to be honest, it's true. I sat there like, he is right. If it wasn't for that, I probably would have continued to just be the big heavyweight because my coach always would make me go to the cafeteria and just stack my plate with food. Eat this, grease, eat this, and then we go into the weight room. I just want you to be big, heavy. You're going to put weight on somebody. You're going to club somebody. You're going to outmove out somebody with the body weight. But then when I started losing weight, I figured we can be different, Coach. I can just be agile. I can outmove these guys. I can be smarter, quicker, and last longer than these guys. And that's just uh, what I went with. And I'm the same way now in fighting. Your dad wasn't on your ass about losing weight? I mean, he was on my ass about lifting, which is something I always hated to do. He never cared so much about me losing weight. My foe, if you know the Anderson side of my family, my dad's side, they're all obese. But my dad, actually, he was in high school. I see pictures of him and my mom when they met in high school. My dad was a real big kid in high school. And I don't know what got to him, but he ended up losing weight. And now he was a bodybuilder at one point. And now he's actually a fit. He's, what, 56 or 60? I can't remember if he's old. <laughs> but he's about 60. But he's you see him. But he's still athletic. He rides his bike all the time. We got the gym in his basement. Mm. So, like, the work ethic has always been in me. I just didn't really care about my physique until that competition happened with me and my buddy freshman year. But, like, the, the click between, oh, wait, all this hard work actually equals great results. When did that, when did that happen? It sounds like an obvious thing, but until you actually really grind for something and then you get it, you're like, oh, right. This is what I have to do. Yeah, okay. So I, it was two times it actually clicked for me. One, I wrestled since third grade in high school, or third grade, and I didn't get my first win until I was a sophomore in high school. Wow. So then it was that's like, a lot oh, of losing. That's a lot of losing. You were like the, uh, well, who, who's the team that plays the Globetrotters? The, the Washington, Washington Generals. The generals, yeah. You're like the Generals out there. The Washington <laughs> Guard Commanders, I think. Yeah, they're, they're pretty but close. But see, yeah. at the same time, it was a lot of losing, but that losing helped me. It molded me to who I am as a fighter because when I would get those big losses, when I start, like Jimmy Mano knockout, I'll never forget that. I'm being in the back, and the coach and everybody was upset. And I was, like, not cheery, but I was still, like, I was kind of cool, okay with it. Like, and my coach was like, how is it that you can make it to your first main event? You just got knocked down in the first round. You're not pissed like me. I was like, coach, the one thing you don't know about me, I lost the majority of my life growing up. 
we're going to lose. It, it happens. So at that point, losing wasn't like, like, oh, my God, I lost. It was, I have did this my whole life. So it's easy to bounce back when you grow up losing and then you start winning. It's like, yeah, we're going to lose again. You don't want to lose, but at the same time, you can accept that loss a little better. And just remember, I lost my whole life growing up, and now look at me. Look at where I am now. It's because of those losses and the hard work. And then the second time was, like I said, the coach I met who I'm working with now at Marion University. He used to, I remember when he got the head coaching job and he saw me, like, you can be great. I see you. I see what you do. You can be good. We just got to make you work a little harder and change some things up. Never forget the next morning, 6 a.m. Over the door, him like, what's up? Told you we're going to be good. We started now. Let's go. 6 a.m. to the weight room. Next time I got a class, he had my class. Let's go. Back to the restroom. Stay in some motion. And it was like every day he's had me working and working and working. And I remember coming to that season unranked in the first duo meet. I wrestled number three dude in the country. And I almost tech fall him. Mm. And he's like, see, I told you you can be good. All that hard work, it paid off, right? Yeah, man. Because after that, I was like, dang, man. And this, to this day, like I had him in my corner in the UFC for a while. And now he's helping me work out in Indiana. Like that's just, I call him all the time. I was actually on the phone with him out there. Today's his birthday. Happy birthday, Coach Bradley. But uh, he instilled something in me. My father put the hard work in me, but he put more like a belief in the hard work. Like yes. I believe in your preparation. A thing when Coach Steve Rivera, wrestling coach in Jersey, says believe in your preparation. He actually brought that to my attention. Where like if you put the hard work in constantly and you actually believe it, Good things can happen, man. You can be great. But I didn't believe it until he made me work. And I went out there and beat that kid that bad. And he told me, like, look, and to this day, like, we're like this. We are super close. And on my birthday, call me. Happy birthday. Work hard today because it's your birthday. I got here then back to Jersey. You have a good workout today? How hard was it? Did you push? You good? Like, I'm good. It was a good, good workout, coach. Good. Good job. Talk to you later. It's like he calls me for little things just to give me messages <laughs> to keep me going. And I'm just thankful to have people like that in my life. Here's what's crazy, and I love you you sharing that story, is 99% of the fighters I talk to when you talk about, like, how were you able to bounce back from this potentially disastrous loss? And every single one says, I, I wrestled. I've been through it. I've been through not only the losses, but the heartbreaks. The, 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 and it's like we sometimes talk about wrestling as potentially the best foundational base to then translate into becoming a full mixed martial artist. But there's something mentally that, you know, I'm finding out too is really there. Like, look, the wrestlers are fucking different, bro. Okay? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, and maybe it's that, that ability to, uh, to use defeat as fuel. To keep yeah. getting better. I mean, you got to think in wrestling, especially when you get to college, you wrestle every weekend. So Friday, Friday we're on the road, Saturday we wrestle, sometimes Sunday we wrestle too. And it's tournaments, you got dual meets, and you got to turn into a tournament. So say you start a tournament, it's like 36 men in your bracket. You lose that first match, but now you got to wrestle eight, nine matches just to get back to place around. Six, seven matches. How many people in your bracket? And then you can do all that and get back to the place around and lose again. Then it's like, oh, now you go back to wrestle back up to 6th or 7th or 7th or 8th. It's like, and you can't, if you let those losers defeat you early in the tournament, you're done. Because we start a tournament at 9 a.m. And sometimes we don't finish till yeah. 1 a.m. midnight. So you sitting in there in the, in the stands like, oh, I lost, I don't want to be here. The next match, you're going to go out there and get that ass tax quick. They're going to spank you real fast. So you got to have that mindset, no, put that behind you. Put it behind you. We still got... So many matches ago, I had a teammate. He lost the first round of Nationals, ended up coming back and take third. But he wrestled all day long, nonstop. He had that first loss, and he knew, in order for me to place, I got to beat eight guys to get back to the top. And he beat all eight guys, made it all the way back. But he wrestled every, like, once every hour. Finished his match, rest by the time he's just cooled down. Uh, Monty Riley, you up on the next mat in the hole. It's like, and he did, and he kept going. But I... I love seeing that because for two days straight, he was wrestling nonstop because he wanted to place. When most kids, you lose that first match, it's like, oh, I'm no longer can be the champ. And then your mindset changed. You don't really yeah. care to wrestle as hard. But if you can put that loss behind you and still think there's still a brighter side to this, I can come out here and still finish at the top. I won't be on top, but I'll be at the top of the podium. Same thing in fighting. If I lose, it's like, all right, now my next fight won't be working towards the title, but I can start working my way back to the top. Yeah, the same thing with our staff. All these guys, they took so many L's with chicks, <laughs> and then it just hardened them, and eventually they got, you know, the, now they got girlfriends, you know? He'll, he'll do this periodically in the conversation where he just derails it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm teasing. It's, it's relating it back to life. I know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so, so then to that point, you didn't take the Manoa loss too hard, but have you ever had a loss that aided you a little bit? Because here's the funny part. We started out talking about that your next fight is going to be the Vadim Nemkov fight, which... 
If you'd played the rules a little differently, you could be wearing the strap right now. Now, again, I think you're probably favored in the rematch, but neither here nor there. To this point, has there been a loss that kind of aided you a little bit more than the other ones? The Theon blocker was lost. I, was, I knew you were going to say that. Why? It didn't aid me because I lost. It aided me because I didn't go in there and do what I do. You know, a lot of people, oh, Corey got knocked out by, by Jan Block, which is in the heels of champ, but people don't realize what was going on behind the curtains for Corey Anderson. Like, the stuff I was dealing with with the UFC, going into a fight, like, I, I felt I deserved a title fight. You know, that's why you had Anthony Smith, who got a title fight, who had beat Rashad Evans and Shogun, who were older guys. I hadn't done anything in years. Then you got uh, Demarazza. He came in, came to 205 after I was already on a three-fight winning streak, and he get three wins, and he gets a title fight. It's yeah. like, I'm beating all these top guys. I had just beat Glover Teixeira on a week and a half notice. You like, had dominantly. destroyed uh, Johnny Walker at like yeah. the peak of his, mm -hmm. you know, hypeness. And they had told me if Johnny beat me, he's most likely to get a title fight. So, you yeah. know, stuff like that, Benny, it's like... I remember my manager called me for the fight, like, oh, bro, they're not going to give you title fight. But this is what we can do. We can actually wait. I feel like if you wait, you're the next guy. They have nobody else. They have to give it to you. But the only way we can be for sure is if we take this fight. We take this fight. I said, like, who is it? Like, Jan Block. And I knew I didn't want I really didn't want to fight. Why didn't want that fight? Like, I already you already beat them. Yeah, I had beat them bad. Yeah. You know, and I went in that whole camp. It was like I trained hard. Training was great. But my mindset was never really... I was never really set on going out there and beating him the way I did the first time, just beating him again. It was, I have to go out there and beat this dude in dominant fashion to make sure I get a title fight. And the only way to be dominant is to knock him out. And that's not my style. Like, I've knocked guys out, but I don't have knockout power. I'm not one of those guys that's going to throw a big hook or a right hand and just push you to sleep. Ryan Bader might say this. Yeah, I'm about to say, yeah, you yeah. give props to Ryan Bader that way. <laughs> but I'm saying, okay, I'm not known for it. I can do it, but I'm not known for it. My style is go out there and make you worry about the wrestling, and then that punch might land. Like Johnny Walker. I, kept, I shot two times early, and I started faking and faking, and I kept seeing his hand going. And I faked and came with the overhand. Certain things, but I didn't do what I usually do to get those wins. I went out there and told myself... I already made him just do once. He can't touch me. So I'm going to go out here and play his game. And it cost me. And the reason why that, not just that, but that ate me up. I was thinking about this a couple weeks ago. In my life, I've only lost two rematches, and both rematches come because I really didn't want to wrestle that guy or I didn't want to fight that guy. And I was like, I already beat this guy. I'm going I'm to kill this dude again. Yeah. And I went out there, got overzealous, and didn't do my thing. And the same thing happened to Jan. I remember him saying, oh, Corey got lucky. And to me, I was like, what? Lucky? How do you get lucky and rape somebody for three rounds? Like, I'm going to prove it. I'm not going to take him down this time. I'm going to go out there and just beat him up standing. And it cost me. If I would stay humble to who I am, just do what, do what I have been training, believed in the preparation. We trained wrestling, ground and pound the whole camp. I went out there and didn't do any of that. I, I believe it would have been different. Who knows? I might still be in the UFC, and I well, would be the UFC champ. But that fight day. began a, a very pivotal stretch for your personal life and career that is now taking you to where you are now on the doorstep of a million dollars and another chance at the world title. And, like, you went through a lot of that away from the cameras. You had a fall, is that correct? Yeah. And we saw the Instagram pictures months tell, later. Tell, but tell us what happened there. Uh, well, after that fight, I remember they told me, oh, you're fine. Cause I, when I came to I remember everything. Now, were you still and, under contract with UFC at that point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I remembered everything that happened in the fight. I remember the whole fight. I remember getting up and talking. They asked me, like, I'm good, I'm good. I remember going to my family and the fans, like, yo, we've been here before. Keep your head up. We're fine. I'm straight. And uh, they told me, oh, you're fine. Just take a couple days off. You can go back. So I'm thinking nothing, no big deal. No concussion. I'm straight, even though I probably did, which I most likely did. I got home. Well, we stayed in Arizona. I got home, went right off the plane, and just I hadn't really slept because I'm still thinking about the fight. In my head, like, I remember my brother calling, like, do you really want to be here? Because in that fight, you didn't look like yourself. Do you still want to fight? So in my head, I'm asking myself all these questions. Do you still want to be in this? And when I do that, like, I'm an outdoor, I'm a hunter. I love being outdoors. So when I can't sleep, I can't focus, I just go to the woods to get my mind clear. And so I went off the plane, got home, dropped the family. I went straight to the woods with my dog. And I was out there all day, like, in the sun, just thinking, thinking. And I remember going to a buddy's house, and he pulled up, and I went to walk to his truck. And I just remember for a second, I got, like, a little light spin. And I wake up on the ground and got gravel getting dust off my face. And, like, and my wife showed me a picture, and my whole face is just, you know, I guess I hit the ground. It was scary. Balls. It was yeah. it was alarming to see that picture. I was it's, like, holy crap. Yeah, and that's the thing. And I remember I had a son at, the point, at that point. I just had my son. And my main thing with fighting is always I want to be in and out of fighting before my kids can see something bad happen to me and then wonder what dad does for work. And mm. they got to see... Daddy's hurt, or daddy in the booboo. And it didn't click until I was in the hospital doing all these tests. 
to make sure it was just a concussion. That's what the final verdict was. The doctor's thought, maybe it was your heart, maybe it is. And I got a wife who's scared. She's panicking. She don't want to lose her husband. Of course, yeah. You know, and then she bring my son with me to visit me in the hospital. None of it registered. Frank Yeager came and visited me. My coaches came. Like, all of it was, like, touching to have them, but it didn't hit me until my wife brought my son into the hospital. Mm. And I remember what I said before I started fighting. Like, I never wanted my kids at that point to see me hurt. And the first thing that my son said, Daddy got boo-boo. And that, it killed me. Did you consider... Walking away? Yeah. I remember at that point, and I told my wife, when she, he's sitting in my lap, and I'm sitting in the hospital, I still got the picture on my phone, I say, I can't do this no more. She's like, what you mean? But I wasn't saying just fighting, it was, I can't keep fighting. It was, like, I'm dealing with the media all the time, the uh, keyboard warriors, oh, queers, and stuff. I'm trying to prove something to these people instead mm-hmm. of just fighting. I said, I can't fight three fights anymore. She said, what do you mean? Like, I can't worry about fighting my opponents. I was arguing with Dana White and Mick Maynard all the time, like trying to prove something. I can't argue with the promotion. I can't be out here trying to voice my opinion to these fans. All the time. I'm fighting too many battles. I got to worry about whoever's in front of me. If we're going to do this, I got to I gotta focus. I got to do this the right way. I got to go in there for one mission, get these wins, and get home safe. Like, I don't want my son seeing me like this. Like, it hurts to this day to even think about it. And, uh, yeah, I remember when we got home, and was waiting for all the verse to come back, and I told her, like, if we walked away right now, I remember sitting in my son's room, putting him in bed, like, if we walked away right now, like, we got the money saved, like, how would you feel if I just said I'm done right now? And it's like, if it's the option, I mean, if we have to do it, I'm here with you regardless. And when the verdict came back, it was clear to go, and I remember talking, like, do we walk away or what? She was like, how about this? She make me one more promise. So you go out there, and you just, you do what you do, and we keep winning, but if something happened, we have something scary like this happen again, we're done, right? Like, that's it. We're do one more time. We're going to do it one more. We're going to do it safe. We're going to change the way we're training. got a good other half. Because shout out oh, to your wife. Oh, yeah. My wife fights, too. She used to fight. That's how I met her at Rufus Sport. I met her the first day I went there. And uh, so that was it. Everything changed. Training changed. I started training smarter. I don't spar as much. Just keep all the damage from... Like, we spar. and we spar, we go. But I'm doing everything I can to keep from avoiding damage in training and take the damage in the fight. And just change the mindset. When I go out there to fight, I ain't here to fight. I'm here to win. You know what I mean? I'm not here to go here and throw a brawl, which I'm not going to sit here and take punches. I'm going to do everything I can to avoid punches to make you feel my wrath. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's just that's what's been motivating me. Well, that something changed in you, and we can see that. Your results are showing that. But that this gray area of you getting sick and, and you, you falling and, and being hurt, suddenly you're out of your active UFC deal. And it mm. was... Very surprising. It was huge news. You become yeah, a giant. From our side of the uh, equation, we were like, what? Because we don't know about this. You become a big free agent signing for Bellator because you're in the midst of your prime. You're a title contender, you know, in the toughest group. Yet, what the heck happened for you to go from in the deal to out of it just like that? Was it as easy as Dana just being like, walk? You want to go walk? No, I mean, for them, it seemed like, so we'll do it. we we'll keep it peaceful keep it in the high energy area, but I was out helping DC at the time for the Stipe third fight. And I remember when everything gone, so when I did the final test to get cleared, I remember being in the hospital and they, the doctor comes in, it was literally, this all happened within three minutes. So the doctor come in, my wife was there like, Mr. Anderson, good news, you can go back to beating people up. Everything came back clear, mm. there's no hard problem, it's literally just a concussion, you're fine, you're clear to go, do what you wanna do. I'm like, great. He hands me the bag with all my stuff. I turn my phone on. As soon as I turn my phone on, I got a contract from UFC and them instantly. Like, yo, y'all didn't even see if I was okay. Like, I literally just got this procedure, and the procedure was they they cut my wrist open, they put, like, adrenaline in me and pump a drip, put a tube in my heart, and they pump adrenaline in my heart. So what they're trying to do is they shock in my heart to make it stop, but you're wide awake. So you feel it. So it's like getting shocked with paddles Damn. and your heart is jumped. So you strap down to the table, but you can't move. Mm. So my mom, I'm messed up from this whole procedure. Like, yo, I don't want to do this ever again. So I'm strapped to the table and they like, they call, like, Pat, my misery calm down, you're fine. And like your heart is pumping out your chest. And like, I'm still in trying to gather what just happened in this procedure. When I turn my phone on, I got a contract from the UFC to fight and they keep the cry off. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. That's how they feel. They're not even call to see if I'm okay. We take this fight and I'm gonna show. I'm good. Let's go. Well, I signed a contract. I send it back while I'm in the hospital. On a ride home, or like, it was not even that. It was like an hour later when I get home, and then I get a call from my manager. Well, no, Nikita's hurt. They want you to fight Yuri for hot shit. Damn. So I'm like, that's fine. But like I just told him before the Johnny Walker fight, I'm not fighting no more new guys. Like, he had just gotten the UFC. Give me a little more money. Like, at the time, I was barely, I, don't, I made six figures one fight in my UFC before I got there. 
Like, at least give me some money. I just went through all this stuff. I'm thinking about the procedure. I just had to go through sure. that procedure. Like, I have to get some value for this stuff. I'm not going to fight this new guy again just so you guys can hype him up. Give me a little bit more money. And it was like, we're not giving you anything. You're taking this fight or you're done. And this, I is, remember, this is the fight behind the scenes that we don't get to see. Exactly. Yeah. People don't know this. So I remember we I went out with D.C. and all that. And I went to D.C. and I remember calling my man. She was like, yo, do we have to do this? He's like, brother, just think about it. We don't have to. This, this, and this. What do you want to do? Thinking about it, I'm thinking about it. And I'm training with DC and I see how good I am. DC telling me, like, bro, there's no reason why at the end of 2021 you should not be the UFC champ. I train with people. The only person that can go five rounds with me and do this stuff is Cain Velasquez. And I'm thinking, like, yo, I'm that good. So why would I be undervaluing myself? So finally in my life, I'm valuing what I can do and how good I am. And I, just, I remember calling Ali and was like, yo, can we just, can we get out of this contract? I'm like, if they're not gonna give me any more money, I'm not gonna keep fighting for peanuts. Like, I got a family on the way. He's like, you right, you got a daughter on the way. My wife was pregnant at the time. Like, I'll see what I can do. I'll call, I'll call USC and see what we can do, blah, blah, blah. And he called me back like five minutes later. Do you really want out? Like, we can probably get you my money. Do you want out? Like, yeah, man, I want out. You don't see that that often. But not, no, that's a bold move. But literally 45 seconds later, I get a release email. Wow. And that right there, too. I'm like, I had just hung up the phone and my email went off. And I knew right then. I called my wife, like, they didn't value us in the first place. She's like, what do you mean? Holy shit. I was like, shit. I literally got the phone with Ali and I got an email that they was letting me go. Like, they didn't care how good. Whatever we did, we were never going to so get So let me ask you, from the moment you had the first conversation with Ali saying, I think I want out, he does what he does, and then you get the release email, how much time has elapsed? Not even 35 minutes. Holy shit. Which told me, it's like, <laughs> they just didn't value me. And that was fine. It's business. And, like, I met with Hunter before the Johnny Walker fight, and he said it straightforward. Like, it's, it's the fight business, but we're here to sell tickets. Who's going to put butts in the seats? And my style didn't put butts in the seats, and that was fine. So, but within this time, we released, and within another 20, 30 minutes, I get an offer from Bellator, and I didn't even question anybody. When I saw that number, I was like, yo, this is real? Like, those was really no. That's what they just said. That's what they wouldn't do. They, I told them that you're a free agent. They want to do that. Like, fine. He's like, you don't want to try nobody else? Like, no. Like, that was more money I've ever even seen on anybody's contract. Sign that right now. Like, deal. Mm -hmm. So within an hour and a half, I went from having a fight contract, asking for more money, told no, release, and new home. That fast. And, like, I just told my wife, she's like, are you serious? But we was going to get the UFC, bro. Like, yeah. And in D.C. said it, too. Like, bro, like, I was, I didn't really want to leave because I know I can be the UFC champ. But at the same time, he said, bro, let's think about this. Right now, before I called and said yes, let's leave, he's like, right now you're in love with three letters. He said, the belt is a belt. But all you're in love with is the belt from the UFC. Yep. He said, you got to think if the money you can get elsewhere can change your life and you're not happy here, you got to do it. Like, yes, I love the UFC. For me, they made me a millionaire. They might not ever do that for you. So you got to go where it's going to be best for you and your family. And when I left in that first count, when I seen the numbers, it was I could have got more if I waited and got some other places. But that right there, when I did the calculations in the contract, like, I would be a millionaire in no time. Like, I appreciate you sharing that story because there was some speculation at the time that, that – you know, because they don't let people out of their deals. That maybe you Not had very some, often. some leverage yeah. against them due to some, you know, medical mishandling. There's a lot of gray area. It's good to hear you sort of give us the, you know, that in the end all your tests turned out great, that you're able to get back and look at the production sense. You've been incredible. Um, now, every time you do an interview, I feel like people pull quotes out, whether it's exaggerated or not, that Corey Anderson says he's going to make more in this fight than he's made in, you know, 12 UFC fights combined. Is all of that stuff true? It's true. After my second fight in Bellator, I had made more, more than that. I made more by my second fight in Bellator than I had my whole 15 fights in the UFC. After I remember the first check, when I got that first check at Bellator, I remember calling my wife back, backstage and said, call the gym, tell them you're done. She said, what do you mean? Like, you don't have to work. She was the GM at the gym. Like, you don't have to work no more. Like, you don't have to work no more. Everything is paid. Like, we got the mortgage, anything we want. We want to buy a house. Everything is paid. Like, you don't have to work anymore. She's like, good, but I want to work. You can stay at home and raise the kids now. And that's what she, now she loves it. We got the house here in Jersey. We got a house in Indiana. I wanted a tractor. I wanted to buy a tractor. I want a zero turn. Got a zero turn. I want forward. Whatever we can do. Dude, whatever I we get want. That now. zero turn lawn, bro. That like, thing sounds amazing. But like I remember seeing Anthony Smith. I was cornering a fighter, and he said, "Of course, I'm gonna say we had our little beef in the UFC." That's what I'm gonna say. You look truly happy over in Belgium. I'm happy for what you're doing. I said, "Yeah, yeah." So it's true. What they say they say money can't buy happiness, and you realize they just didn't have money because it don't make. <laughs> and look, it ain't the fact it makes things. Like, you have because you got money, because life is a lot more stressful. Well, it gives you, fr I'm finding in life, and I don't make, you know, probably life-changing money yet, but we're doing all right, Luke. We you do and okay. I, we do okay. It does, you know, one of my friends put it perfectly. It does give you the freedom 
to actually live your life more. Yes. And, and if that's at the end of the day what, what we're all kind of chasing, that freedom to spend more time with our family and make these great memories separate from our profession, that's, that's fantastic. Because that phone call, honey, you're not working anymore. That's like an American dream life-changing moment yes. right there. 100%. And it happened. So right now, all these headlines and podcasts, is there a fighter pay problem in, you, in, in MMA? Or is there just a fighter pay problem in UFC? Yeah. What's your solution to fighter pay? I think the fighter pay is just in UFC. Because I remember... Now, after the Johnny Walker fight, if you guys remember, I did the media and say, yo, if you're not going to give me my just do or what I deserve, cut me. And I remember right after Derek Brunson calls me. I was like, bro, don't say that. If they cut you, you're not going to make nearly as much money anywhere else. There's no organization that's paying like UFC does. You're in the best place right now. Like, do not, don't say that again because you will be cut and you'll be like, man, I'm not making nearly as much. And then when I signed that contract, I remember talking to Derek. He's like, bro. I didn't know they had money like that out there. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I don't know how much he making, but I told him, like, yo, I'm making way more than I made. Then he's like, well, I'm happy for you, bro. It's like, you, we are all, especially the casuals and the fans, they are made to believe since UFC is the plateau of where to go, you're going to be making the most. Everybody think that, but only Conor McGregor, John Jones, certain people make that money. If you're, like Hunter told me, it's about putting butts in the seats. Yeah. If you're not a person they're not promoting, you're not going to make that money. Like I said, I had 15 fights there. But when I went into that Jan Blockwich fight, the second time, you know how many, many of the media people didn't even know that was the second time fight? I had somebody ask me, why is this called Corey versus Jan 2? Like, you really don't know. Because if you're not promoted, they don't know anything about you. They didn't know I had beat Jan before on my sixth fight ever. They didn't know that. They didn't know how bad it was. They didn't even know we met before. Because if they don't promote you, you're not going to have the fans behind you. And that's any business. They got a promotion. That's for Bellator. They do when they don't have, like, one person they promote more. It's kind of like they don't promote a lot, but when they do promote a fight, they take time to promote everybody on that car, whether it's somebody on the first fight. Like, I remember the Jalen, what's it, Jalen, whatever. He's doing pretty good now, but I remember when he only had one fight. My first fight, he did, or his second fight was on my debut fight in Bellator. And I remember them promoting him. I'm like, who is this kid? I started looking into him. I'm like, oh, this kid's going to be pretty good. And I remember in the hotel room watching him fight. Like, yo, that was a slick submission. But I only knew about him because Bellator took the time to post stuff about who he could be and who he was, who he trained with. As for UFC, it's like you go to these cars and you see them. It's like, who are these guys? But like, who's fighting at USA, the main event and the co-main? Because those are the big name guys. Unless it's a guy that's very hype, like Kamzak Jamaya or Johnny Walker and those guys when they were lower on the car. Because they were exciting. But even if you're not excited in Bellator, I feel like they're giving you at least a little bit of just do to let the fans know who to watch. You know, so. Do you believe in a potentially a fighter's union? <sighs> so. It's again, a complicated question. Like, yeah, could it's it work? A complicated could it not? It's a good idea, a bad idea? Well, you got to think about unions, period, is always messy. Like, my father's ribbon company is a union company. So I know. A lot of things are going to union. Look at Jimmy Hoffa, very messy ending. <laughs> yeah, very. Nobody know where he is, right? Well, <laughs> East Rutherford, New Jersey, underneath the goalpost, I think, is last where they saw But uh, then you see a non-union, and it's, it's a... Because my dad had a union, and at one point he had a non-union company, and he liked the non-union because it was less politics to it. So even just like in the fight, it's politics now, but I feel like if we get a union, it's going to be... It'll be a little a lot messier, a lot harder. It's going to be hard to get fighters to fight. It's going to be... Yeah, I think it's fine right now. You just got to learn how to stand your ground and get yeah. what you deserve. And like I said before, after I left, like if you're not happy with it, go out somewhere else and you're happy, just like anything, any job. You're not happy with your job, I wouldn't expect you to keep getting up every morning and miserably going. I would tell anybody, like, if you don't like your job, quit. Go find a job you do like. Would you like to see some of the... Uh, and again, some of these are a little bit esoteric, but some of the, you know, the Ali Act, uh, which covers boxing. So boxing does have federal regulation, which is why some of the purses look the way they do over there because the promoter can't control the title, right? It's by law they cannot have it. Um, there's financial disclosure laws. There's all kinds of stuff that make boxing. Like, it's not an accident boxers make more. It happens for a reason. Would you like to see some of those protections extended to MMA? Yes. No, that's a little different. That would be nice, yes. Somebody where the promoter doesn't control the title and stuff like that, that would be great because at the end of the day, in the MMA game, the promoter is the one calling the shots. You know what I mean? Dana White, Mick Maynard, Hunter Campbell, and those Joe Silvers, all those guys, and Sean Shepard, those are the ones that run the show. There's nobody else that they have to answer to. They are the top of the – they are the bosses. It's like we do what we want to do at the end of the day. 
Sometimes they answer to Disney only when Tachi Palace is involved, though. Look, that's a <laughs> yeah, different story. Disney getting involved. But you actually, that's kind of funny you bring him up. Joe Silva, uh, you you got into the game when he was still around for a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, any crazy Joe Silva stories? The only crazy- he called me up and he read me the riot act one time. I mean, the only... I had two conversations with him, and the only one that kind of rubbed me wrong... I mean, I'm not a... I don't really get bothered much by things. I just let things roll off my skin like a duck in the water. And the one time it was my fault, Fabio Maldonado on another two-week notice. Didn't have a passport. They got me a passport. I went to Brazil. I dominated him. And I remember, uh, I can't remember who it was, but his wife messaged me like, oh, did you get the little, the um, the extra bonus behind the behind the curtain burners they give you whatever? I'm like, I haven't got one yet for this fight. She's like, oh, me either. I wonder what's going on. Then she hit me up a week later, like, a week later, I got mine. Never mind. Did you get yours? Like, no. So he drove up, like, yo, am I going to get a bonus for this fight tonight? He's like, nah, that was a boring ass fight. I'm not giving you nothing. Uh, like, a boring guy. Like, I went on two weeks. What you expect me to do? Sit there and box with a professional boxer? <laughs> like, I don't know. I suppose it was two week notice. I didn't have a camp. I took him down to. Meanwhile, the neck bull, milk boys are just flying shit. Yeah, so no, he was like, pulling out 250K large. Just yeah, he said that. I was like, okay, I'm not a real big fan of this guy. And I remember once I ran to him in Vegas. And it was a group of us. And he cracked the joke, and I, I ain't, I'm not a person. I'm going to fake anything. If you crack a joke, it ain't funny. I'm not going to laugh. And I didn't <laughs> say anything. Don't, no. don't humor this motherfucker way. at all. Yeah, I didn't great. say anything. And then before you know it, I get a call from Ali. Like, yo, what did you just do? Like, what do you mean? I just got a call from Joe Silver. He says, you're a real asshole. Like, <laughs> what? Like, I didn't even do that. I didn't laugh at a joke. First rule of improv, Corey. Come on. You got to sell the other guy's joke, all um, right? That's not me. I'm as real as they come. I, would, I, I cut would, straight. If I may, I would love to talk to you about... Um, I have seen that the fighters who are the happiest, it takes them a while to get there, and they're ones who have realized that there is a utility in talking to the media, but they have a somewhat of a... Div- not divorced. A... a They've learned how to navigate that space without being bothered by it anymore. Dustin Poirier comes to mind, for example, right? Mm-hmm. I think you're in that space as well. What has been your relationship to the MMA media? What have they gotten wrong about you? How do you view them now? And by the way, we're two stupid jerks here, so feel free to not hold back. We don't. I'm not looking for any sugar-coated answer. I mean, one thing about Corey Anderson, not talking about myself, I hate talking about myself first per- person, but you ask anybody, what do you think about Corey? They say he's a straight shooter. I'm an open book. So one thing with MMA media, and they know that, and they'll ask questions and they'll get it. My wife will call me like, you shouldn't have said that. Or my mom will call me like, well, you, 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 you just say too much on the air. It's like, I just don't, I don't have any secrets. But now it's to the point where you figure out on the fly how to word things correctly. Like earlier when I said we're going to talk about the situation, how I left the USC, like I'm going to keep this as peaceful as possible. Like without making this sound like a negative, a whole thing, I got any hate, I don't have any hatred or anything, but you just got to know the media is here to, they have one objective, to get information out of you that others don't know yet. So, sometimes, like, when you look at Ariel, Ariel Hawaiian, like, he, when he does that, he, like, picking or picking. He's trying to get you he's to surgery. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to get you to say something that's going to be, like, bait against Dana White or something. Something that's going to, he can use. But, yeah, like, such and such said before in another interview. So, the biggest thing is you just got to be aware, like, when you come with these guys, they could be friendly, but they're not literally your friend. It's not somebody that's going to, they're not on the air trying to make you look great. They are trying to get your take. But at the same time, they want to get some dirt out of you or they're trying to get some bad info out of you. So the biggest thing I take is take what you guys ask for the grain of salt. Don't take any offense to it. But at the same time, be smart with your answer. But I'm, I guess I'm, I'm more fair enough. But I'm also wondering, like, do you feel like they have given you your respect? Oh, no. Hell no. <laughs> t- 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 so tell me what has been missing. I mean, it's a lot missing. Like you said, you see articles, they take one little thing, you say one thing, and they'll take it around with it. Um, for instance, now I don't blame Damon Martin for this one, but I think it was more of an ESPN thing. The last interview I did after the fight, and he asked me a question like, oh, do you regret the fact you left the UFC this instance now, seeing how good you're doing? Like, I don't regret it, but you know, at times I do, somebody asked me, like, you ever think Dana White wonder... Blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, it, it came to me after he said, I wonder if Dana White regretted cutting me, like letting me go at the time. I wonder if that's the case. And the media came on, like, oh, Corey Anderson yeah. and said, he wonder if Dana White misses him. You're like, no, that's not, I don't care. I'm happy where I am. I'm grateful for where I am. But at times it does, when somebody asks you, you think, like, then you think, like, dang, I wonder if he does. And that's all I was saying. It's like if your wife asked you, do you ever think about your ex-girlfriends? You just don't answer it, right? Because uh, she'll take it out of context, like the media, no. use it against you. You ask my wife, I'm real as they come. She asks me, I'll say something. Like, it pisses, why would you say Like, you ask the question, I'm going to keep it 100. It's like, I think about certain things, I think about certain situations, you know? But 
And that's just, <laughs> I, I'm a real ass dude. That's one thing about me. My wife will tell you, if you want to know something, you ask Corey. All right, let's like, ask Corey the truth on a couple things then. This hat, is it raising or lowering my tea at age 44? Get rid of it. <laughs> this shit is ugly. All right. I saw it when it came in. I didn't know if he was wearing okay, on the air or not. You know, I, I, you thank know, you, Corey. I I'm so glad you're here. You know, Corey, when you look at Luke Thomas, I mean, you know, just uh, one dye job could really turn around his Should I dye my right? face in here? Yeah, women love gray hair now. That's the thing. Eat shit, loser. <laughs> Eat shit. You I got a little that. bit coming in right here. Just I know. Die yours I know, but this guy will show up looking like late stage Elvis on the toilet with his hair <laughs> dyed to the nth degree. We had a shoe polish accident once. Oh, by the way, we serve all guests. These are Brazilian nuts because we've been told as dads, you know. Yeah, I don't think he's got a tea problem. That I this just... could raise your testosterone, the Brazilian nuts. I was told that by one of our producers, Matt, um, Matt R., by the way. And uh, Where's this know. bit going? I was going to chew on something while you guys were talking. Okay. Hey, I want to see your... Uh, this is going to sound like a weird question. Let me see your hands. Other way. What the fuck is that? Whoa. Can we put the camera on that? What the fuck is that? That's evidence from Glover Chaysera's <laughs> chin. Oh, oh, my God. Hit him with an uppercut. I can't remember if it was second... Yeah, second round. Hit him with that... No, first round. I hit him with that uppercut. Big uppercut. And it's permanent. I remember my... Yeah. My, I remember my hand hurting. And later in that round, we got into a grapple. He grabbed my hand. I was like, what the... I looked down. Like, yo, my, my time, my finger was like stuck like this. Like, yo, what's going on? And I remember after the fight, I taped my fingers together just, just to maybe keep the motion. And yeah. when I took the tape off, it was stuck like that. When it got it checked or tendon ruptured from here, and now this is just all scar tissue and everything in there. Damn. So, so now is it, is it like, uh, is it like, are uh, you like the thing from Fantastic Four? It's like clobbering time now. You got like extra brick. On God damn. Hard as a rock. <laughs> Holy smokes. Your other hand has a little something, too. I mean, that's is just that fighter arthritis? fingers. Yeah, that's just jamming my fingers from wrestling. You've had a ton of injuries, man. I mean, not so much. Rip word? Yeah. Should we go through them? Yeah, let's go through them. All right, so you got the hands. That's okay. relatively small, but good that's for Halloween. Good, that's good bag media. Good for just, Halloween. Yeah, yes, come back media. That's not an injury. That's just... Life. I'm fairly certain that's an injury. <laughs> fairly certain. In uh, the Midwest, that's how... That's I call it injury like. something that you have to miss a fight for. Okay, so fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I think for the average, you know, loser like me, I see that and I'm like, eh, that's not normal. Okay. But okay, uh, let's start. Your ankles, I think you've had multiple issues with them, correct? Uh, shattered my leg in three in wrestling and broke my ankle, same leg in high school, yes. Okay, any knee problems? I mean, I just got sore knees. Never had any surgery or like no, that? No. Hip? No hip surgery. Back? No back surgery. Shoulders? I need surgery, but never had it. What's wrong with your knees? No, my shoulders. Oh, your shoulder? What did you get? You tear a labrum? Uh, my wrestlers tore a labrum and my rotator cuff. You know, that's just. He was carrying a giant chip for a few years, too. Yeah, he's got that going on as well. <laughs> just, I mean, my main thing was blast doubles and high crotches. So you hit a high crotch, somebody oh, yeah. sprawled around it. And you run that pipe, it brother. And we you know it. The, yeah, and then you do the blast double and you hit with your shoulder, just pop out. So I remember the first time was, well, my red shirt, sophomore year in nationals, shooting blast double. I kept shooting, shooting, taking the guy down. I'm going to do it one more time in the third period, and I remember hitting my shoulder went back, and it popped out. It popped back in. I go, your shoulder subluxed, but it kept doing it to the point like it tore the labrum. And later on, the next year, I went D2. I remember hitting the high crotch, and it got sprawled, and it tore the rotator cut. Damn. And later on, doing the same thing in this shoulder. It happened again. So it's like just the wear and tear. It just happens. And they go, oh, you got to get surgery. Like, nah, I have to take time off. I don't have time to waste. I got to just keep rehabbing and just keep working. And they work okay? And they found Do me. Do they click and pop? Oh, 100%. Yeah. It actually came out. And the Shogun Hua fight, my shoulder came out. I remember in that fight in the first round. I remember I threw a punch and I missed. Oh, he hit me at the same time I punched and I missed and the shoulder went out. I remember in the round, coach was like, yo, why are you hanging your arm down? I'm like, my shoulder out, coach. He's like, what are I going to do? Pop it in? I'm like, I don't know what, because he told me. We don't want to take Shogun down to the end of the round, like third round, because he got jujitsu. At the time, I had none. Like, the only way I can get it to come back in if I blast double. Like, if I blast, I land hard enough for it to pop back in. Like, it always happens. Like, I guess you got to take him down. Like, guess what we do, huh? Holy <laughs> I shit. I right at the get-go. I jab and blast. As soon as I hit the fence, it pop. I was like, oh, thank God. And I finished the takedown. But other than that, I just deal with it. Nails. Bro, that's some psycho shit. I oh, mean, you think that's crazy? You should have seen the, or the Gian Volante fight. That's what happened to that one? I got all these teeth crushed out in the first 45 seconds. What? Okay, walk us through. What happened? <laughs> I went to shoot, and he threw the front kick, and I hit his knee. So if you go back and watch, you'll see it. And I stand up, I touched my face, because I felt it was like a hole. Like, I got a Damn. scar in here. All oh, this is busted open. These teeth were out. Five teeth crushed in the back of my mouth. And I remember so feeling... So you could taste the particles of tooth. Yeah, I was holding my teeth up with my tongue. You called Mark and asked us that. I remember going in the corner, and he's like, yo, where the blood coming from? Like, they seen the hole. I was like, yeah. What's going on? Like, I held my teeth in my tongue. He's like, what? 
hold my teeth in my tongue. Like, I'm holding my teeth in my tongue. And he's looking, I, I move my teeth like, yo. And he's looking at me like, all right, so this is what we're going to do. Do not stand in front of him. <laughs> Keep moving. Do not let him hit you in the face again. And like, so that whole fight, all until the last minute, that I was holding, I was biting my mouthpiece, but holding my teeth in. So I was this scared I was going to swallow those five teeth because they weren't connected. So I had to go and they, they pull it in, they brace it. That was, that was painful too. Being in the hospital, getting that braced in. But yeah, I fought two and a half rounds. Holding in that teeth with my tongue, fucking and just crazy. still cracking and getting cracked. There's a guy in the cracked. wire, the senator, that's just like shit. Everything he says, that's my reaction oh, every single time. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, that's just, so uh, from your transition from Cle Senator, senator Clay, Clay, Clay Davis, Davis yeah. thank you, Gaff, in my ear. Your transition from collegiate wrestling to MMA, how crucial was coming across Ben Askren in that regard? I mean, it all happened because of Ben Askren. You know what I mean? He uh, had Whitewater my senior year. He was a coach there, helping me out. And uh, that's how you met him initially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I remember finishing nationals. I took second in the country, and I remember going back again. It's one of the moments I lose, and most people are upset. They lost in the finals. I'm on the podium laughing and cheering and stuff, and people are like, why are you so happy? Like, if you knew where I came from, you'd be happy too. Like, if you knew my life, you'd be happy like you got here. And I remember Ben texting me. and was like, congratulations, Corey. At the end of the day, you start with 1,000 kids every year that want to wrestle, and only very few enter to the finals, and you did it. Grand joint took second. I'm happy for you. Congratulations. And I had talked to him in the season, like, I wanted to wrestle for the Olympics. I wanted to keep going during the Olympics and all that. And so he's like, all right, so I want to start working with you. You can meet me at this gym. So I'm thinking we're going to start wrestling for the Olympics. Well, the gym, the address was Rufus Sport. I had no clue. Again, but thankful for that, this is where I met my wife. I go in that first day, she's working the front desk. She has a white water Wisconsin shirt on, which is the school I'm at at the time. Her brother went there the year before I got there. <laughs> So I talked to her. I meet Ben. I'm like, yo, what is this? This ain't no wrestling gym. You see Anthony Pettis over there doing his thing. This looks like a trap tire. to me. Yeah, you got uh, Eric Coach and um, Pascal Cruz. They all these UFC guys doing media at the time. They doing uh, kickboxing or some class. Like, yo, what is this? He's like, this is your new sport. I'm like, what do you mean my new sport? He was like, I know you want to wrestle. But the way you wrestle, you could be so good at fighting. And I just, I just want you to try. Like, if you don't like it, we we'll go back to wrestling so for the Olympics. Was it your, that. wasn't your footwork that he saw that he? That you, well, that's the thing. When I wrestle, I never wrestle like you normally wrestle. Most guys tie up. I'm moving just like I move like in a the boxer, fight. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's what I did in college. My brother. You had a couple of amateur fights, right? Yeah, my, boxing. My boxing. box. My brother-in-law at the time was a professional boxer. Who's so, this? Uh, Pat Cat Coleman. He was like a local guy back home, but he had a gym. And I broke when I first broke my leg in college. They're like, you gotta do rehab, blah, blah, blah. I'm, like, I'm not doing rehab. When I got back, my brother, like, yo, we can do boxing work and do some ladder drills and some stuff, get your footwork. And I got so good at that. He's like, we're gonna do a couple amateur fights. You wanna do an amateur fight? Did the first one, beat the former Golden Gloves champ. And he was like, oh, we can get you another one. Knock the guy out or TK him in the first round. And after that, like, yo, why don't you go pro? This is it. But I couldn't get paid. So I like, I can't get paid because I'm a college athlete. I went back, and I would still do the footwork drills and all the stuff we did there, hitting the bag and footwork. Just keep my footwork for work for wrestling. Like, I do it now. I teach the kids. When somebody go to tie up with you, I bop, like weave, like I'm slipping. Same thing. Somebody go to tie up, I dip. It's just make you miss. It's just things I use like that yeah. into my wrestling. I used to wrestle that way. He just had me come to the MMA gym, and I didn't do it that day. I was like, I don't want to do this. I'm done. I went home. But the whole way home, like, why did I not take that opportunity? Why did I not do that? Maybe you could have... Maybe because your friend was deceitful. Yeah, well, maybe... But yeah. <laughs> well, my mind was set on wrestling for the Olympics. To pay Ben to back, you refused to help him learn striking. That's what you did. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> so anyway, the next day, it's like an hour and a half. I wake up and I go back. Like, I have to do it. I got to give myself an opportunity just to try it. And I went back and had to be sparring day. And uh, first round, he had me go with Anthony Pettis just to feel leg kicks, the coach, Duke Rue. So he's like, I'm like, yo, we can do it. Like, yeah, I don't want to feel this. Like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah, I was like, Cause I never felt a kick. Just to let me know. He's like, what do you do? I'm like, I wrestle. He's like, wrestle. So I took him down. He's like, ah, right, you too big to be going with him if you wrestle. Yeah, let's say. I went with Ben. So I did a lot better with Ben. Ben don't have striking. They're just wrestling. So it was just back and forth there. Then he had me go with a heavyweight, and I just dogged him. Took him down. Like, punch him on the ground. And he was stood up. I punched him, blast double. And I remember Duke saying, like, I hate to tell you, son, you said you don't want to fight. You're a fighter. <laughs> and you could be in the UFC within three fights. With your attributes, I can see it. In three fights, you could be in the UFC. Like, I've only seen it done once, but you could be the next person. You ended up doing it in five, right? Three. 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 Uh, he went, the ultimate fighter the for the ultimate fighter, fighter third my third fight, fight right. right away. That's and right. I was like, dang, to, to this day, it's in my head. Like, he said that. And I work with Mark Fort Fiore, and he said it. Like, I've seen guys go there. You could be in the UFC soon. Man, Hughes, all these. Like, you, if you took this seriously, you'd go to UFC. And 
It happened you, within three fights. Is there a part of you that, like, again, it's one of these things where, I like, when I say when I say the word regret, I don't mean you look back like, oh, I don't mean that. What I mean to say is, in a perfect world, would you have gone to the UFC in your third fight? <sighs> knowing, that, knowing what I know now, oh, it's weird. Because, like, when my coach say, when you ask somebody to change things like that, when they regret, would you do it different? You got to think about your family. Now I got my family. I don't know if I would be with my wife if I didn't yeah. go in a third fight. Because one of the reasons we got together later, she started a podcast. And that was after one of my UFC fights early in my career. She wanted to ask me. And that's when we hit things off. So at the same time, I don't say, I can't say I wouldn't do it again. But at the same time, if I knew I didn't change the outcome of everything else in my life, yeah, I would at least, at least had an amateur career because I didn't right. have that. Right, right. You know, I took my first loss on pay-per-view. That's crazy. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, That's Marty crazy. McFly's brother started disappearing from that portrait in Back to the Future. You you f with history, you start losing exactly. some people. Luke, okay, so like, I would change a lot of the crap I went through, but I never would have met you. You know. I see, you did well in science class. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talk to the kids at the gym now. They're like, oh, I want to go pro. I want to go pro. Like, man, take these losses as amateur. Learn your stuff in amateur because I didn't take my first actual like a kickboxing class until after the OSP head kick knockout. Damn. Dude, that's nuts. You're 32. I think folks don't realize you're 32. You're like smack in the prime. Yeah. Right? Do you feel like as a fighter, you look back on your journey to this point, obviously you have turned many corners, but do you really feel like, do you feel like you're in your prime physically and from a technical development standpoint? Yes. I was about to say, the development of my game definitely feel like I'm at the prime now. Like, I've gone with guys uh, Roman De, uh, Roman Deledzi. Yeah, uh, he's extreme couture, I think. Or yeah, well, he's he's think? from Georgia, but he comes over and trains yeah. there. You got Bruno Capaleza, the guy that won the PFL. Got hands like that. Yeah, like I before he was with PFL, he hadn't fought in forever. My man's like, oh, I got this guy. He can come out and help you for the Johnny Walker fight. And I go with him, and it was just like, like even him and Roman, they both said it like, brother, you are so like when we do individual stuff like jujitsu, your jujitsu is okay. We do striking class. You striking is okay. You do wrestling class. You're really good. When you do an MMA, it's like you're like another level now. Like, but I remember at times it wasn't like that, and I just thought about it. like it's because of all the years I learned on the job. Like my third fight was an ultimate fighter, or fourth fight was an ultimate fighter. I remember those guys say, "There's no way can Corey can win. He only got three fights before. No way he can win." I just blast double people. Thank you, learn. wrestling. Thank you, roofing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And over time, yeah, it was just learning stuff. That first loss, the second loss, the third loss, the fourth loss. Every time, I never had my head down. I just learned from it. And I remember after the OSP fight, I remember Duke saying something in the back. He's like, you know what you did wrong? He was like, you slipped like a boxer when he threw a head kick. Same thing Usman just did against Leon Edwards. He threw that cross out there, and you slipped the punch, and you go right yep. into the kick. The thing is with kickboxing, you can't do that. You got to keep this X going. Come up, you got to X block it. I can't remember who was fighting that night. And he said, like, dang, that's, that's good. And I said it to one of my coaches, like, you didn't know that? And I thought about then, like, I've never actually took a class. There's a lot of things I don't know. Shit. I remember telling Ricardo, like, Ricardo, you know I've never actually took, like, a, a basic class, right? Like, I never. Hmm? Almeida? Yeah. yeah. Like, he's like, what? Like, I've never took a class where you learn shrimping and you learn the different rules and break fall. Like, I was always, you went with the pro guys and just sink or swim. So it's like, I'm just scrambling and wrestling. Well, every time you add something, man, you, you level up. Exactly. And, and it's showing now at the peak of your powers, the peak of your prime at 32. So we talked about the transition from UFC, big free agent signing with Bellator. You make an early splash. Then they bring to you the idea of this eight-man tournament, Grand Prix, million bucks, world title. But to be honest... I labeled you as a dark horse, but we're talking about, holy shit, Rumble Johnson's in this tournament. Uh, holy crap, Yoel Romero's in here. Phil Davis. But Nemkov had just, you know, made himself a global name. Phil Davis, Ryan Bader, Bader the, the two. Don't let Don Yagshim. I mean, there, oh, there were a, pronounce it right. yeah. there <laughs> a lot of reasons to, to chase the sex factor in other areas. Yet, Corey Anderson all along, did you feel at any point people were overlooking you? I mean, there's a theme in your career. Oh, but but when that tournament draw gets announced, what are you thinking? They don't think I'm going to make it out the first round. It was, it was a fact. It was the painting was on the wall. It was, as soon as it was announced, everybody's first thing, first one to get knocked out quick. As soon as we get here, he's going out. Then, yeah, all the Turkish standings, Jags people was like all over social media. He's going to kill Jags. Oh, they so came hard. at you. Oh, he's going to kill Corey. And I remember we did the media to announce it with Showtime with Bellator. And they told me he was Russian. They said he's the Russian dark horse. I do a media. They go, oh, I got the Russian dark horse first. And I got DM for like three weeks straight. Like, you disrespect us. He's no Russian. He's Turkestanian. You're going to find out. And I was like, yo, like, I just said what they told me. To say. 
But like the whole, like Corey Anderson's not going to make Danny. it. Come it on, Danny. It was memes. Yeah, I, was Danny gonna, Brenner. I was going to post a meme, uh, meme the other day, like a throwback of, like Corey Anderson signs the Bellator, and it was me. It was like a bag, me and a bag of cookies, and it was labeled Bellator, Bell, and me looking. And I look up, and this guy comes around the corner and says, Rumba Johnson. <laughs> like, damn, I can't have shit around here. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, I was like, it's funny because nobody thought Corey was going to make it out of the first round. And then I had the Ryan Bear. Oh, Ryan Bear's got these too much no, for Corey. He's going to kill him. He and I definitely thought you were going to make it past Yaksha Murdoff. But the Bader one was interesting. We didn't really know how that one was going to go. And, dude, you dusted him off. I couldn't believe how fast I'm, that I'm trying to go, okay, you're wrestling against his. going to look like this. First round KO Slip, right really overhand, wasn't right. in my, like, my breakdown of how that fight might go. Was it in yours? Was that yeah. a setup the whole time? Like I so he asked me after, like, bro, he asked me after the fight, and he asked me next day in the hotel. He was like in the hotel. He asked me, like, "I gotta ask you for sure." Like after he had been drinking, he's like, "Did you just throw that punch randomly, or was that like planned?" Like I told you last night, bro. Like we studied your film, and I remember sparring with you twice. Like you, your jab has always been the same. You don't step with your jab. You lean to make it long, but you don't bring your feet with you. And the whole camp. That's what Mark said. We're gonna capitalize on that. We. That's when we came up with that combo. Now that's like a combo we do a lot. But he's like, if he doesn't step with his jab, I got a perfect combo: overhand, uppercut, cross. He step, he don't step, he's leaning, so his head's gonna be out there. Third step with your overhand, you're gonna catch him. If he go back, the uppercut's gonna come, or the cross is gonna put his lights out. I wanted to. If you look back, we threw that combo, we threw two combos. The first one was jab, jab to cross, or jab to the head, jab to the body, cross to the belly. The next one was we knew he was gonna jab. So now, and I heard Mark say, it's coming. You're gonna see me shake my head, like, I know. And he throw it, and I throw it, and the first one falls short. Like, I gotta step, I know. And the next one, he do it, and I step, and I hit him. Perfect. It was alarming how how you took him out. It was yeah. like, oh shit! Like, like like you're doing that now. Not that you hadn't stopped, guys. Johnny Walker, you blew him away. But again, it, you always seem to kind of take it to the next level. So then you go in against Vadim Nemkov, and look, uh, you know that guy had been on a run and he had been beating legitimate guys. Once you started getting in there with him, you you got an edge quickly. How did you how did you feel that the of what we saw that fight? And it's a it's interesting how it ended with the no contest and all that. We can get into that. But how do you feel you matched up with him once that got going? Just like I said, I would. Or again, I, I, I like they say, speak things into existence. If you go back after the Bader fight, I did the media, and they said, what do you think about Vadim Nimkov matchup? He's like a hot pocket. You put him in the microwave, they come on hot. You're going to say, hot, hot. You don't want to touch it right away. You just got to wait a little bit. It's going to cool down. And I said, like, he's going to come out like a ball of fear. He does it every time. But the thing is, most guys, they weather with him. They're trying to keep up with his pace. And they get tired. Thing is, I'm a cardio machine, so I can keep up with that pace. And I'm going to turn it up just a little bit. I said, and I'm just going to wait. And when he starts slowing down, I'm going to take over. So it was really, there was really no surprise. Like, it went exactly how I expected. I told coaches, they said in the back, don't rush anything. It's five rounds. Every time you rush something is when you get caught. Remember, it's five rounds. First round, we might lose first. We might lose second. You still got three more. Just be patient. When you see the opportunity, take it. That was a game plan. We knew he was going to come out fast. He's going to bounce. He's going to bounce. Just stay with him. He started, he started hitting me. I remember at first, I started getting frustrated. And I wanted to rush it. I was like, nope, stay calm. We're going to start rolling with him. When he hits you, just roll your neck. Just let it roll. Don't let it catch. Don't let it knock you out. Let's just roll with it. He's going to slow down in a second. I started slowing down. Like, all right, now we're going to start countering back. All right, you ready? Pop, pop, pop. All right, now he's stopping. Now we're going to lead the dance. Pop, pop, pop. All right, now it's time for that first takedown. We're not going to get it. We're not going to get it. We know he's ready. He's young. He's ready. He's early. Shoot, we got him. He's going to defend. All right, now he feels me. He feels me. We're going to do it again. Pop, pop, Now, look, I remember it was like a minute and a half left. I said, all right, now I'm going to wait. We're going to move. Last 10 seconds, I'm going to tell him, put him on his ass at the last second just so he know. I'm going to take you down. And sure enough, you see, I'm looking at the clock, and right before the bell, I foot swept him to his butt at the mat. And I got up and just looked at him. Look, it's not, you know. You know, I'm going to take you down. You're playing a deeper mental game than you get credit for, I think, in this oh, regard. Of, of Not just how you're game planning, but how you're, like, <clears throat> mentally always ready to kind of one-up him and show him that's the just, command you have. That's the thing. You got to be, it's not just your preparation in the gym, but your mindset is the biggest thing. That's one thing I've, I've really, I started doing this thing, brain tapping. And it's like I do it before bed, I do it when I wake up. It's just positive mindset. So you're always thinking positive. So throughout the camp when I'm driving, I'm always thinking about how do I want to play this fight out exactly? And then it's like, you always got to have a plan A, plan B, plan C, because if plan A don't work, what you going to do? Then you gotta, but then when it starts working, it's like, all right, so now we're going to go with this plan. And it's just paying attention and just keeping eyes on, like Mark said. You got to keep your eyes on. The moment you blink and you don't see something, it's just punches that you don't see that knock you out. So when he started hitting me, like I said, if I start blinking, I'm not going to see these. That's when a head kick going to come. Yeah. The two head kicks he threw, and anybody in the ideal world, those are perfect setups. So I went to lean up, but my eyes on so I could see it come. I was able to get my hand up. Or the other time, I just put my hand tight to the head. It's coming. It's just going to be the foot. Tap it. Just block it. And it's just, 
that's just the mental training, not just the aspect of everything I've been through. But yeah, I do that all day long. I'm talking, I drive, and I'm always talking to myself in my head, sparring, what I'm doing sparring. I'm setting goals for jujitsu. And going to that fight, it was no different. Like all week, I played it in my head, how are we going to do it? But accidental so, foul wasn't in that vision. That, so but, how does it play out for you in real time? What's your mindset? Talk, talk to us about that. Okay, this. I just explained this to like three people this last week. So you see fights where a guy, when they headbutt and they get the blood, the ref will tell the judge, like, don't count that. That was an accidental headbutt. That's all I was doing. I did not tell him. I was not thinking he was going to stop the fight. I heard him say, that was a clean shot. But I was trying to tell him, like, no, it wasn't. It was my head. So maybe he told the judge, like, all right, don't count that damage. That was an accident. I didn't had no idea they was going to stop it until I looked down and saw how bad it was. Mm. And he's still saying, clean shot, clean shot, keep going, keep going. Like, no, it, it was a headbutt. So I'm thinking they were just going to give him a second to click, wipe the blood out of his eyes or something. I didn't know the doctor wasn't even going to come in and look at it. They stopped the fight, and the doctor from the, he, before he even stepped in the cage, he steps at the gate, and he waves it off, like, you ain't even come in yet. Like, yo. Like, it was a bad cut. Yeah, like, it was bad, but at the same time, at least put some fast, let three seconds go away, and then take time to work on it. I was literally just letting him, because I heard him say, clean shot, just let him know it wasn't, it was, because Nemkov said something, and that's all, like, agreeing, like, yeah, it, was, it wasn't my punch, it was my, or elbow, it was my head. Just being... So, Clean which takes us it. now to Bellator 288 coming up on November 18th. You mentioned the other two rematches you kind of didn't want to be in, and they didn't go your way, one in the wrestling, one in the fighting game. It's weird. <clears throat> I can't imagine you don't have all the enthusiasm in the world this time, especially since the first time you were kind of taking that fight away from him, and then the headbutt happened. What is... What are you anticipating from Nemkov this time around? What are you anticipating from yourself? Like, what's it? Have you have you visualized what it might mean hoisting the belt? Yeah, a hundred percent. I've been hoisting. I mean, visualizing that since I got in the game. I came here to be the best. I didn't come here just to be a partaker. I didn't just be one of the best fighters in the world. I want to be the best in the world. I want to hold the belt up. You know, I got. <clears throat> I go to bed and vision this empty spot above the TV with a shot of boxing the belt up there. You know, it's been there. That spot's been there since I moved into the house for that reason in Jersey. And going to this fight, it's like I'm not fighting the same Nimkov. I've been thinking about it the whole time. It's, just, it's a whole new person. I mean, first thing my brother said after the fight, he came like, bro, that was a beautiful fight, but now you know he got intel. Right. He didn't have intel. Now he got Good intel. Point. So he's going to go back to everything he know, and him, Fedor, he got Fedor as a coach, so you know he's going to be legit. They're going to have a game plan. He's got intel. So now you got to come different. You got to come back with something that he ain't seen before. You know, in my mind. Do you think so. you surprised him at how good you were in the first fight? 100%. I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll come clean. I thought he was going to win. And then you, the, way, the ease with which you controlled him in the wrestling was honestly, it shouldn't have been surprising, but in real time it was. I wonder how much you think that's going to play a role in the second part, right? Because wrestling sort of is the central linchpin of your game, even if the other parts are pretty good now as well. Mm -hmm. I mean... You know he's gonna be thinking about it, hundred percent. That's Big the time. biggest thing we know. It's like, well, we already know he can take me down. So I mean, why he was hurt? I heard people message people from Russia and stuff. Oh, I just you know the gym training with Russian world champions yeah. and this is this like it doesn't. I know guys that wrestled with guys way better than me for like a year straight, knowing they had to fight me eventually. It's just if you haven't done it your whole life and you don't have the pace to do it, you might defend it the first four, five, six, seven, but if I keep shooting, eventually I'm gonna get you down. Mm. You know what I mean? Think about it. I fought Pat Cummins, who was an Olympic but world team backup and D1 All American or runner up twice. And, and, a, was, and a, a successful barista before the UFC call up. <laughs> I knew that was coming. But I mean, you know, and everybody, oh, Corey can't wrestle, but it's just the way I wrestle is different. You can go to many wrestling rooms as you want, but I wrestle one way and I MMA wrestle. A completely different. I'm yeah. just relentless. I'm grinding. I'm putting that on you, and there's nobody to implement that unless it's me. Like it's just. So I know that's gonna be a thing, and I know he's gonna try to switch up and probably avoid that. And since I'm, I'm always thinking, what is he gonna do different this time? What is it that he think he had the most success at? Was the striking area? But if he keeps striking him, he's making an opportunity for me to take him down a lot easier. You know, he keep overstepping. I'm gonna grab a leg eventually. I don't really worry about so much what he's gonna do. I just know I gotta go out there and do what I do. A hundred times better than I did the last time. And that's what I've been focusing on. I got this new coach, not a new coach, I'm with the same team, but when I moved to Indiana, I started working with this new coach, Pat McPherson. He was with uh, Chris Lytle, Matt Mitrione, those guys, the Golden Glove, winning his Golden Glove boxing champ, or a boxing coach in Indiana. So I've been working a lot of the striking and different movements and stuff with him. Got Olympic champ, uh, Sugar Ray Seals. He's on the team. He's been working with me, talking to me through some things with striking and just a good jujitsu program. So I've 
taking stuff that they taught me, some new things that I had never did before, and I'm focusing my new game plan more around that because that's he hasn't seen this stuff. You may before. F around and get a tap out for the title, okay? Dude, he might do yeah. a lot more than that. That's pretty hey, impressive. Um, there's right, a lot of things I'm looking to do in this title fight. You said that, yeah, you may have said off camera that at home, you know, there's nothing you won't fix. You're not you're not paying for somebody to come do something. As a dad, as a landowner, when you think about $1 million, forget the title. When you think about that $1 million, there's got to be one item you're going to add to the to the farm, to the land, to, 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 to really, you know, step up even higher in your dad game. You got your eyes on anything? Mohan land. How much? Oh. How much? How much? How much is a hundred acres in Indiana? A lot cheaper than out here in the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I could probably get a hundred acres. As cheap as I can probably find it in a lower rate area, like a lower farm rate area. I can probably get it for maybe five hundred thousand or so. Okay, I mean, so it's in the ballpark of what you could potentially afford. Oh yeah, there. yeah. I mean, it depends on what it is. if it's wood lot, it'd be a lot cheaper. But if it's more crop, which I'm looking for, I want to get some more crop land and probably rent it to a farmer. You know, that way I got income coming both ways. So, you know, I'm always thinking money on my mind. You know, no, you got a firm handle of what you're doing, not only to not let all of this stuff break you on your journey to get here, yeah. but you even talked about when you considered walking away after the, the health scare, that you, you, you mentioned something that not a lot of fighters can say. Not a lot of us can say, you got your finances in order, we could walk away. You've always seemed to kind of be ahead of the trap that, you know, a pro athlete in any sport can get into of spending too much too early. How did that, was that, is that go back to your dad being yeah. on your ass? I mean, I mean, that goes, my father grew up poor. He was the youngest son, his daughter, his younger sister, it was 10 of them, 10 or 9 of them, but he was the youngest son and they grew up with nothing. You know what I mean? So now to him have a successful roofing business and he got the money he does, to this day, my dad washes paper plates. It's one thing we don't understand. <laughs> That's, they, a, that's a bit much. That's, a, that's low, extreme, yes. Like my dad got all his, he washed his, like he still lives, like he's poor. But like my brother said, you got to think, we always make fun of him for it, but you got to think the fact that he's lived that way his whole life is the reason why he's so good with money. He doesn't waste anything. Won't not, waste we not, gotta, won't We got to get your dad a paper plate sponsorship. <laughs> I feel like that's the thing. Hey, man, my dad, it's a, it's weird. People judge him, but if you see my dad, you see him rolling around daily, you would think he's like a bomb. You would not think he is. You go to his house and you see, like, wait, this is, that's just the way he carries himself. But he's always told us since we were kids, if you make a dollar, you save a dime. If you make a dime, you save a penny. You save, always save. No matter what you get, you save something. That's right. Like, it's not going to always be there forever. You got to, and then, like, when I started fighting, I know you're getting your money out, but you still got to pay the tax, man. You know that, right? You got that money in there to pay the tax, man. But along with that, I didn't plan on being a professional athlete. I went to school and got a college degree a business degree. So I understood how money worked, you know, this and that. You can spend spend money to make money, but at the same time, you got to save. You got to pay. To, Uncle Sam going to get his. So coming into the fight game, and like I said, I was a college wrestling coach making 220 bucks every two weeks, but I also had another job at a, a trucking company as a supervisor. I would pay the bills, and I would save every dime. I saved man here, everything. Luke. That's right. So I remember when I left a fight, and the coach that I'm working with now, he was, he was working together in junior college. He said, I know you really want to do this and coach, but think about where you want to be at the end. You can get there a lot faster if you go fight. And I'll always have a job for you when you're done. And that's exactly where we are now. I went back to the end and we're working together. And I thought about that the whole time. I'm not going to fight forever. So I'm going to save all this money. Every fight check was direct deposit to the small bank account back in Illinois I've had since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Same account, same bank tellers I've had since I was probably seven years old. <laughs> They've seen me since a kid. And they know all that money is in there. It goes direct deposit right back there now. So I've never really touched the fight money. Great. Then I have a YouTube channel for hunting, and I got sponsors and stuff for that. That pays the bills. The Reebok money, whatever we got in the UFC, that went to the joint account that my wife would pay the bills and stuff from. I was, like I said, before I went to UFC or Bellator, I was still coaching at the gym. Like, I was doing privates. I would coach five days a week. I would miss practice because I was coaching. And now you get but, sponsors again, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, now we get dude wipes, again. dynamic fasteners back on board. Mm -hmm. with hey, mm -hmm. hey, all that. I would like all of them. Any one of them, you know? And the same, I don't just spend money to spend money. I'm well, not the next time guy. we talk to you, you could be a million dollars richer. You also could be in the argument for best light heavyweight in the world. No I mean, you are in that argument right I now. I am the best in the world. It's already you think discussed. if you beat Nemkov, though, like it seals the deal? Man, people are going to always find a way to say no. Okay. I could, uh, I could go beat John Jones right now, and they'll be like, oh, well, it was John Jones was feeling sick, he said last week. Corey's not the greatest. People don't like me. I'm not the fan favorite, and that's fine. I've come to terms with that. I'm not here to fight and impress those guys. I don't care if they 
ever ranked me one. I said it years ago after I beat Glover and I beat the number three and they ranked me ninth. Like, how do I go down? I was eighth. Oh, no. No, I was ninth. I moved up to eighth and I moved back down to nine. Like, how do I beat the number three and I go back down to nine? And I beat Johnny Walker, who wasn't ranked, and they ranked me five. And I said, like, yo, I could beat the world champ. They're going to rank me third. Like, they just, no matter what, they never going to give me my credit as due. And I came to terms, like I said, after the fall. Like, I don't really care what the people think anymore. Yeah. I know how good I am. I know what I can do. I love the introspection. You know, he was matters. honest earlier. He said he was addicted to those three letters. Luke, you've been addicted to three yourself, BBL, and it's really, you know. All right, good. on that <laughs> note, let's wrap up here. I have a, uh, he Big is, booty Latina, sorry. The well, he you know, is, it's, um, <laughs> it's a personal thing. <laughs> he ate a lot of paint chips. I think I'm uh, Brazilian butt lift. For well, that's, like, that's on, close. But it's, it's, in, it's in play in that category, Luke. Uh, we're, we're ashamed of him. Yeah. Uh, your nickname is Overtime, but when you started, it wasn't my favorite. I'll be honest. The Beast in 25-8. I don't even know what that means. Um, when, <laughs> when, when did you change from Beast in 25-8? Is that to a overtime? dorm room name? What is no, that? No, it was something my brother, me and my brother had. It was a brand. It was a shirt, a logo. It's still the still the brand. It's still my company's com company is Beast in 25-8 LLC. But actually, that's pretty cool. I like it that. It started off like okay. So when I was in college, like I was working out all the time, training. And my brother, I remember coming home, and he was a professional poker player. And he was always playing. And like, man, you know what pissed me off? And you go places and I see other wrestlers, they all say, man, I'll be going 24-7. I'm going 24-7. But I've never seen nobody train like you and grind like I do. It's like, we going 25-8. And I remember he looked at me. He was on the computer. He was playing online for me. He looked at me and was like, hey, bro, we making a shirt. Beast in 25-8. That's it. And this was actually before I debuted in the UFC or after I did the Ultimate Fighter. And I was going to do my debut. He was like, we're going to make you a shirt. That's your name. That's going to be it. That's going to be it. Beast in 25-8. And that, hey, and that was it. Always we went you know, it's good that I wasn't in the room because I would have talked you out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Similar hey. to the Brock Lesnar chest tattoo. We, yeah. we, somebody could have talked to my It was more of a using an aspect to get the brand out there because we were just going to yeah, start yeah. a little clothing line. When, and if my name was out there, it was going to let it go. But the, the clothing line fell off and I just stuck with the Okay, name. but you did switch to overtime. Yes. When was that officially? That was when they came out with the top 10 worst nicknames in sports oh, history. Oh, someone hemmed you up? And like, I was, okay. Well, Mark Henry and them... When probably, I remember it was at Ricardo's Tuesday morning, getting ready to spar. And Mark was like, yo, I just can't read this guy. Look, the 10 top worst nicknames in fighting. You know who's number two? Corey Beasley 25 a.m. We got to change it. I can't be associated. We got to change it, guys. We got to change it. I'm like, yo, it is what it is. And I remember Eddie was like, Eddie, I was like, yo, why don't we do like time and a half? Like, wait, that's way Time and a half? Like, that's too damn long. Yeah. Like, was like, well, the whole point of Beasley 25 8 was. That's like oddly specific. Well, the thing is, like, I'm working more than other people. Like, if everybody go yeah, nine yeah. to five, I'm doing the extra. Yo, like, I'm on oh. vacation. I know. Pay, he's like, right? how about Corey PTO? <laughs> Anderson, like, what? Like, time and a half. And in the background, you hear Frankie as he warming up. He's like, oh, overtime. I like it. That's time and a half. I like overtime. overtime. Frankie has the He's like, it's the there same is. thing. It's overtime. It's beating 25 8. Or it's time and a half. It's beating 25 8. Doing more. You're doing overtime. And it's like, and then we can show the OT. I'm like, that's it. Mark was like, I like that. And I was like, I like that one too. That was before the Sean O'Connell fight. And I remember keeping it a secret. I changed the name. Like, don't tell nobody until we walk out. I don't want to hear it until I walk out. And that's been it since. Well, I got to tell you, I, uh, I'm not a pred I don't predict the future. But I cannot wait to see what happens on November 18th. You've been working overtime for a very long time. And um, I know that you're not concerned with the opinions of two idiots like me and him, which is quite fair. But it would be nice to see uh, somebody who's been putting in the hours and the sacrifice that you have ultimately get the rewards that they're looking for, right? All I ever say in the fight game is fights are hard enough and everyone's careers are difficult enough. All you can ever hope for is that everyone gets home safely and they made the best man win. And plastic plates for his dad. That's and where plastic I'm going. Plates he, for he, dad. He, he, even he can, 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 you know, raise it on up. But uh, in, in, in all seriousness, we appreciate you coming by, but more to that, like, it would, it, it would be... I can't wait to see what happens on the night 18th, man, because it seems like it's a long time coming for you. And you're right now, 32 years old. Seems like it might be your time. Yeah, I think so. Like you said, long time coming. That was the... The staying on the shirts last time, a long time coming. Now, this time it's unfinished business. So, time to go get it done. There's a November beast 18th, in 25 8, okay? Right. Brian Campbell, Corey Anderson, Luke Thomas, Room Service Diaries, Showtime, November 18th. This guy, Fadim Nemkov, in the main event. OT. See y'all there.